Thanks so much, Candice, uh, for the warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm Adil Ligari, uh, Solution Architect Manager over here at CloudSmith, uh, and I'm joined by some lovely folks. And uh, welcome to our webinar entitled, So We Know We Have to Secure the Software Supply Chain, But Where Do We Start? Uh, now, this is very much a carry forward from our last webinar we did uh, in partnership with the Linux Foundation, which was uh, everything you wanted to know about securing the software supply chain, but didn't know where to ask. Um, that is That was from March 10th, and it's available, of course, on the Linux Foundation uh, YouTube site, uh, as well as the CloudSmith YouTube, of course, as well. So this is the next step, sort of, we know uh, we have to secure it now. Now, how do we actually go about the practical first steps to do so? So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'll walk through the agenda here real quick. Uh, we'll do speaker um, up introductions up front uh, and let everybody know who we are and what we do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our organizations and what we do as well. Um, then we'll we'll touch on a quick summary from last time just to carry forward into that. And again, you, you do, it's not a homework. It's not required reading. You don't have to go back to the old one. You can if you want. We'll summarize some of those points here uh, quickly and touch on some of of some of some of us what got us here and why we are actually tackling these hard issues um, uh, for everyone. And uh, in addition to that, then we talk now about what's next, right? Um, what progress has been made in this space since since our last discussion in March? Um, you know, the wonderful open source projects, six store cosine, uh, you know, um, and get signed some of the stuff coming out of the six store project and, and and some of the steps that have been taken there, some of the stuff we've taken in as an organization, and that we can recommend that you may want to take as an organization in the, in, in in this process. And, and then We'll also, time permitting, also touch on where there are still gaps in this process. Now, of course, it's still early days in some ways that they say for so securing the software supply chain, but we've been saying that for a year or so now already. So I think I feel like taking some steps is good, but it's good to identify where there are still gaps and where there's room for growth as well. Uh, and then if we, time permitting, of course, we'll have a Q&A at the end as well. So um, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A section if you if you want to. Um, again, you know um, uh, we're we're happy to take on anything um, that you, you guys um, think of that you folks uh, um, in the community would like to ask uh, in terms of securing the software supply chain. So with that, without further ado, let's hop in. Um, I'll talk about myself real quick first. Um, so I'm a, a assisted man and I'm passionate about automation. My name's Adil Ligari. Uh, I'm active in the PowerShell and DevOps automation communities um, for quite a few years now. Um, I'm a speaker and author and blah, 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 blah. I don't need to add to that introduction. So let's move on, I'll move on to Luke. Luke, over to you. Oh yeah, and thank you for having me. It's really good to be here. So evidently Luke Hines, I work at Red Hat in the CTO office and uh, lead a security team. And we're focused on what we term emerging technologies. So most of our work, we're very lucky we get to work upstream and create interesting new projects. Some fail and some succeed. Had a lot of failures and you know the odd one that's got some traction. And um, outside of that, um, one of the folks that started Sigstore, a project that's gathered a fair amount of uh, momentum recently, but I also do uh, various other things. So I'm a Kubernetes security response team. So I manage the uh, Hacker One bug bounty program that we have there. There's a group of us that manage vulnerabilities in uh, Kubernetes. I'm also on the technical advisory council of the OpenSSF. So I was one of the early OpenSSF folks. That's the Open Source Security Foundation. It's part of the, the Linux Foundation. And various other things as well, confidential computing. There's a confidential computing consortium that I'm involved with on the board member there. And so I keep very busy in the, in the open source world and I'm really lucky to um, be in the position that I get to work on open source most of my days. So, yeah. It's a very unique uh, space to be in, uh, to be able to work in open source for your day job, Luke. And I will say Red Hat is one of those organizations that supported this from the beginning. So we appreciate you. Yeah, very much, yeah. Awesome. Over to you, Lee. Yes. Okay. It's very hard, hard, hard to follow Lick, uh, but I'll try. So <laughs> my name is uh, Lee Skillen. I'm the co-founder and CTO here at CloudSmith, which you'll learn a little bit more of later on. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about security and the open source ecosystem. And in fact, security has always been one of those things that I think um, has touched every point of my life as a developer. Um, maybe I'm lucky in that way. Uh, but anyway, it's I think it's it's uh, it's influenced I think the the company that we're trying to build at CloudSmith. And certainly, whenever we started out, we set out to make artifact management uh, easy to use and hard to misuse. And the hard to misuse aspect was to make it as simple as possible, um, as simple as possible to configure basically pipelines and delivery without introducing security issues. So that's me. Awesome, Lee. Thank you. Over to you, Dan. 
Thanks, Adil. Um, so hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Dan McKinney. I'm a technical account manager at CloudSmith. You can probably see by my Twitter handle, I was formerly developer relations at CloudSmith. So I spend a lot of time talking to CloudSmith users and customers, both open source users and, and commercial customers. And, and I hear them ask a lot about how do they secure their software supply chain? It's a topic that comes up increasingly and there's barely a conversation goes by with our users and customers where, where we don't discuss this. So I'm here to give a, a bit of an insight from the user and the customer side. From the front lines, Dan. From the front lines, Adil, absolutely. And I don't want Dan to sell himself short. So he wears a lot of hats around here at CloudSmith. And one of them is our resident DJ as well. So Yes, that's true. I, I also write our documentation, I should say. I'm a formerly <laughs> a technical writer, so I write the CloudSmith documentation and tutorial videos as well. Generally, I try to help our users. Awesome. Well, well, Dan, 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 Dan just say to. that uh, the customers love Dan so much they wanted to keep him as close as possible. That's yeah. right. <laughs> that, that, that's why I became a technical account manager. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Many messages from our customers start with, hi, Dan. Yeah, they do. <laughs> true story. <laughs> Cheers, sir. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining me. I'm lucky to have such folks to be working with. Um, okay, so quickly, let's just touch on um, about CloudSmith a little bit, about us and what we do. Uh, won't, won't spend a lot of your time here. We want to focus on a lot of the open source projects out in this space as well. So, so Dan, do you want to lead us off with a little bit? Yes, certainly. So, uh, I mean, Lee, Lee sort of touched on this already. I'll, I'll ask again for more input in a moment. But, but CloudSmith is a, it's a fully managed uh, cloud-native sort of package management as a service. So you know we offer universal um, repositories, hosted repositories for for binaries and artifacts. Uh, we support twenty eight package formats and multi format repositories. Keep them all in one place. We have global points of presence, four hundred and ten plus, and and a big part of what we do is we integrate with all the tooling that you already use. And we'll talk about this later, especially with the the sort of emerging software supply chain tooling as well. So. You know, ease of use is, is a huge part of, of what we say, because if you make it, you know, easy to use by default, people are more likely to use it from the get go. So ease of use is, is a big thing that also extends through to the tooling and software supply chain as well. So that's what CloudSmith is fully managed package management as a service. We're also big supporters of open source. Of course, we host and we provide free hosting for open source projects. And we host some fairly big open source projects, things like RabbitMQ and, and Caddy, and the, the web server as well, um, among others. So big supporters of open source projects. And, and that's the kind of services that we offer them. So Lee, would you like to add in what I have failed to mention? Uh, probably the, the only thing I would say is that uh, CloudSmith was designed from the get-go to be a natural fit for the ecosystem. So basically, we're not a platform. It's definitely an ecosystem product. It integrates well, plays well with other products, um, certainly for the cloud-based ecosystem and the clues in the name. Um, in fact, a lot of people ask us if we have on-premises solutions, and the answer is no, because then we would have to change the name. Um, but, <laughs> but yes, end-to-end, uh, -end, I think, is what we call in terms of what we're trying to support. So it's a, it's a tool for your tool set that helps you to help manage that entire pipeline of edit artifact production right through to production. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you both. Uh, let's hop over and uh, get an introduction on, on the Red Hat CTO office and sixth door from Luke. Yes, yeah, sure. So um, to, to tie these two together, uh, Red Hat has really been focused on supply chain security for quite a good number of years now, much before it was called uh, supply chain security because of our, obviously being a Linux distributor, having a package system, which was very uh, a high target for attacks, okay, with the likes of RHEL, because RHEL runs, I think, most of the like the NASDAQ and various stock mm -hmm. exchanges all run on, on RHEL now, and so some of the big verticals military, public sector, telco. So, so we've, you know, we've been used to being a target for a while. And so we've always looked at build security. And um, <clears throat> so I've been taking an interest in this. I've been working on some, another project, which was uh, moved into the CNCF, a project called Keyline, and was tasked with looking at how can we improve the provenance of what we're bringing into Red Hat, okay, supply chain security. And, and is that something that could be leveraged for Red Hat customers as well, typically us being a, a Kubernetes shop. So I, I started to, to look at this, this area and, and I had this idea that 
we could really benefit from some sort of oracle of truth, okay, some uh, credible store of provenance, and then thinking about how would that provenance be captured, and we could then leverage that internally for our own sort of uh, improving the view of, of what we're ingesting upstream from open source projects. So I started to work around, I think this was kind of pretty much just as we were going into lockdown. So 2020, sort of March time. And originally played around with blockchain. So I tried a few different blockchain platforms that are out there. And then realized really that the whole aspect of a, a token, which is very um, uh, susceptible to uh, uh, prices going up and down, it just wasn't the right platform. I mean, I mean you could have like a, a private blockchain but then it wasn't a truly decentralized platform as such. So I just couldn't really get a good fit with blockchain. So I heard about transparency logs and how they'd be leveraged for certificate transparency and so forth. So I started to work on a prototype there and uh, that was originally Recore, okay? And um, Recore was really around uh, having an immutable, observable, transparent source of what's happening in the supply chain, okay? so. We then had that other folks started to get involved. It's kind of a typical open source story from here. I built something, kind of had it, wanted to take it in a certain direction, but started to share it with other people, get some, get some uh, consensus from others as to, is this useful? And then other people started to collaborate. So we had Dan Lawrence come on, who was at Google at the time, uh, Bob Calloway, the other one of the original three as well. He was, uh, he was working in Red Hat at the time, he's at Google now. Uh, it started to get involved and, and about that time I realized really if this was gonna be widely utilized, it had to be in the public domain, okay? It had to be vendor neutral and it had to be like a, a, a for the public good, okay? So the open source projects would start to, to leverage the technology because the more that would leverage the technology the the better fingerprint we would have, the wider scope that picture we would have of what's happening in the, oper in, in the open source community. So I won't kind of go into the full history of SIG, so I'll save it a little bit for later. <laughs> as well. There's another question that's pertinent to that. But that's really how these two connect. You know, SIG stores originally um, something that we envisaged as being of, of use to Red Hat, really. I'm not really seeing it much out of that context. And uh, and then obviously we realized that this could be something that could be much bigger and much more widely used. So I managed to speak, uh, talk our CTO into signing the project over to the next foundation and it became an LF project and, and now it's an open SSF project. Awesome. Thanks so much for that background, Luke. Uh, really helps to frame our discussion. So as yeah. we lead into this now, um, I just want to touch on, so quick summary from last time. And what we'll do now is I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take the slides off because I want this to very much be a fireside chat and open discussion. Mm -hmm. So so let's keep up, uh, us up on the screen and, and we'll touch on a little bit of, of conversations from last time, just to recap everyone, get everyone up to speed on, on what we discussed uh, in March, right? Uh, with Dan Lawrence, of course, from, from mm -hmm. Google and Stigstore and uh, Fame, as we've talked about with, with, uh, with ChainGuard as well. Um, so we touched on last time why why soft securing the software supply chain was so important now some of the you know vulnerabilities that came out over time some of the hacks the solar wind hack dependency confusion attacks um and you know the executive order um, with the, the nation's cybersecurity. um um so talking a lot about how software bill of materials and sbom has has uh, sort of risen in prominence uh, uh, in terms of a way to uh, you know have a first step to securing the software supply chain, having proving provenance and showing how you need to actually um, not only be able to um, show what's included inside of a container image, but also be able to prove that that is actually what's in there. So ways to sign it and have test it in that process too. Um, then we touched about on, on why this is such a hard problem for organizations to solve. Uh, and we can even discuss that a little bit again now, but but I think part of this is, you know, certain organizations uh, in the private sector, you know, um, started moving away from open source software, which we believed was the wrong move. Um, and a lot of us in, in the open source community do because, you know, 90% of the stuff we develop, just to present it that I'm pulling out of the air, but uh, probably pretty good, uh, is, is um, you know, based on open source projects. And I, 
and really those, I mean, the, the argument that Dan Lawrence made last time was that, you know, uh, it's actually a, a lot more of a secure development pr practice to use open source pro projects because they have been vetted, they have been open, developed out in the open, and, you know, the code isn't abstracted or obscured away in any way so that you have that, um, you know, ability to 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 see exactly what you're what you're implementing. Um, in addition to that, you know, obviously the disparate tooling, and I think we can all speak to this a little bit, but in the space of trying to secure software supply chain, um, you know, trying to make this easy and accessible, simple and frictionless um, has been a challenge, right? Because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of layers to it, um, um, you know. Being uh, having uh, Luke, as you talked about, an immutable infrastructure to be able to verify things and to, to like um, so changes, you know, um, uh, are not like uh, stuff is not easily changeable and, and then manipulatable by dev in some ways, right? Um, you want to be able to prove things out, and you want to you don't want uh, necessarily uh, you you don't want you, you want secure development practices essentially, and you want them easy, right? And and sometimes historically, you know, the, the public keys, private keys, a lot of the other stuff in that process um, has been a little bit, you know, every dev has something running on their machine, but it's not really easy to scale that or to maintain that or to secure that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's specifically touching on why it was a hard problem and, and talking about some of that. Uh, we also touched on, um, you know, what does secure software supply chain look like now? Some of the projects that are coming up, we talked about um, the Salsa framework specifically, and of course yeah. the SIGSTOR project, which uh, you're one of the co-founders of, uh, Luke. Uh, and so um, also from our perspective with CloudSmith, some of the stuff that we committed to um, with with uh, in that space as well, uh, in terms of being able to uh, allow users on our platform to prove provenance in an open source manner as well, right? Uh, and so kind of the next logical step from that, um, and I'm, I'm moving the slide deck virtually in my head here is, um, you know, what's being done in this space now and where, where are we at, right? An update sort of thing. So since March, um, one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that we've done on our end is is uh, made that available for everybody. So on our platform, and as as many vendors come onto this now, um, we are supporting those open source projects. In in that, if you are using uh, a tool like Cosign to um, sign your container images as well as sign att and attest your S bombs, um, we allowed you to host that alongside your OCI Docker container images. So we made a commitment to do that, and we, we that is being delivered now. Right, Dan. Just yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Thanks, Adil. Yeah, no, that is that is something that we have delivered. And I mean, this is this is a topic that comes up, um, and I said this at the start, increasingly. And I mean, it used to be, and I'm old enough to remember without giving away my age, but it used to be that it was primarily larger enterprises in specific industries that were heavily regulated or had, you know, really strict compliance requirements. So healthcare automotive and um, th those kind of things. They were the types of users, especially in CloudSmith that I spoke to that were uh, most concerned about, about uh, software supply chain security. But what I'm saying now is that even smaller companies, even smaller groups, you know, 10 person startups, they're starting to ask those questions as well, which is why we brought support for Cosign, support for as you said, being able to use in total attestations for S bombs, we we roll that into the product, and we you know we talked a little bit about this beforehand, but we believe that you need to you know sort of democratize this stuff, so it needs to be available to the smallest users on CloudSmith right up to our enterprise users, so we don't put it into the enterprise plans. It's sort of very bad karma to sort of make those you know, chargeable enterprise features because it was a good good phrase actually that Luke used beforehand and I'm just going to blatantly steal it, which was that the tide lifts all boats. So by bringing these features to CloudSmith, but at every at every, at every every user, so right the way from the smallest to the biggest, um, uh, we've started to see more adoption of them. Now, of course we brought them because people were asking. So, you know, we're driven by what we hear in the community. And this is something that we just kept hearing over and over. I've been with CloudSmith for a few years now. And as I say, there was always this sort of discussion. And, and Luke mentioned that, that Red Hat have been looking at this for a long time. I've heard this, but I'm just hearing it more and more and more and more. And now every time I join a call with a new user of CloudSmith that wants to get onboarded with the product, and of course, that's my job to help users utilize the product, 
it comes up on every single call now. It comes up on every single discussion. So that was really what what drove our our development roadmap in this direction um, was was listening to the customers, and that's what the community and the customers are telling us. So yes, it's all there in the product now. It isn't in a walled garden. It isn't fenced off, and it's following that sort of CloudSmith eth- ethos. It's easy to use, you know. And we'll talk about this <laughs> later. I'd like to mention salsa and things like that. And um, uh, it's if you make it easy, then people will integrate it quicker. Look, we've always been able to sign packages, right? We've always been able to take steps like that, but it wasn't, it was, it was never easy, right? You know, I, I mean, people, you could sign packages with GPG keys and RSA keys and things like this for a long time, but because it was, you know, not, not terribly difficult, but it just, it added some friction to your workflow. And when friction appears, people will, will you know, they, they'll scoot around it and take the path of least resistance. So those security principles need to be on that path of least resistance in order for people to just sort of, you know, adopt them en masse. So yeah, absolutely. We, that's what's changed from March. And I mean, I was on that mm-hmm. webinar with, with Dan Lorenz for, from Chain Guard. Mm-hmm. And I, I said all that kind of stuff then as well. And it is nice to be able to come back now and actually stand over some of those changes that we we have made since then. Um, talk is cheap, as, as you say, and development time is not. Um, mm-hmm. So it's great that we've been able to, to bring that out. Um, and it's been well received, right from our smallest users, right up to the biggest enterprises. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And also touching on the same point, then I know Lee brought this up earlier, was uh, the fact that I think recently attending Open Source Summit and, uh, and stuff, there there's a lot of, pretty much every talk is talking about uh, uh, software supply chains, right? That was a big point. Yeah, I think there was a lot of topics that were focused. Obviously, it's very topical at the minute, software supply chain. It's in vogue, and this is a great thing, right? You know, so Mm -hmm. it's probably something that we've been familiar with for a long time. But just in terms of like global mindshare of like how important it is, events like that are really about pushing the boundaries in terms of like understanding and awareness for people. However, one of the things I did notice is that the vendors were there. Cloudsmith was a vendor there. Red Hat was a vendor there. And there was other amazing companies that are developing within this ecosystem, software supply chain, and things related to it. But whenever talking to quite a few of the attendees there and sort of asking about what they're doing, you know, either in terms of their, you know, personal lives, in terms of contributor students for ecosystem, or more importantly, what they're doing at the places that they work. Uh, I think it's still, the, my observation was that it was still very nascent in terms of like the actual usage out there, you know, so I think what was noticed is that not only are we not in the ecosystem doing enough in terms of like, you know, all the amazing advancements we're talking about here, about SIG store, transparency, attestation, adoption of S forms, things like that, but even some of the lower hanging fruit of do you check, do you know, do you have processes to make sure that the software that you've downloaded is the software that you intended to download or, or integrate? Or what does your processes look like in terms of like ensuring that actually the dependencies that you bring in, that you're building your product with, you know, some your critical product, your, you know, it's the it's the IP for your company that you're selling, you know, your lifeblood is that is that, but the how much do you think about, you know, the um the risk that we're adopting whenever you're adopting third-party dependencies? It's still very, very naive, I think, you know, and I think there's a lot of work to be done just in terms of building awareness. And the thing is, is that the people have realized that there's processes are, and realize that security is important, but I just think it seems like um, the ecosystem hasn't arrived at a point where we've made it as frictionless as possible to adopt in, into, into companies. And if we can even just further that a little bit by this conversation in terms of awareness and show the path yeah. in terms of the tooling that can be, be utilized, but also just like the simple things that people can do, then with, you know, with with at least further a little bit, and that's just necessary. We just have to keep on trying, you know? Mm. So I think that's probably a fantastic segue um, into talking to Luke here, and I'll offer it in terms of like, because he, I think he has additional stuff to share. And I'm very interested myself to hear some of the insights, Luke, especially like in the difference, and maybe this will be a topic for later in the call, but the difference between the old school way of our, you know, our checksum and signature generation that would be relying upon the company's own pipeline to something where we arrive at the public transparency chain and just and just sort of the difference between the two of those, you know, because it's not just about the company itself now. We're talking about supply chains and a supply chain is the connect between producers out there 
and consumers, and sometimes the consumers are also producing software for other parts of it, just continues, so on and so forth. So it's a much wider problem than just our private use. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you frame that well. Um, now, in a lot of ways, so if we look at the former model, okay, where uh, somebody would have a long-term private key, typically most of the time you might get a few fringe security geek developers that will have a private key, you know, and and uh, and, and they will lock it onto a UB key, but they're they're a very small minority, okay. Then the other uses you have is your big corporates and enterprises where they can afford a HSM, which is locked in a, a room somewhere and you need to sign a clipboard to get the key and go in. And it's all very, very strict operating uh, environment around access to that, okay? And then you've got the rest of the world, the kind of the 97% the that just don't know what to do. Do you see mm -hmm. what I mean? They're like, I could generate a private key. Do I keep it on my home drive or do you know um, what CH mod 77? I guess that will do, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. What happens if I lose my laptop or what happens if somebody steals, you know, what if I want to use it on different machines? Should I put it on a USB key? Then I can move it around. And, you know, so just it's a, a minefield for users, you know, for that, for that majority if you see what i mean and a lot of this was a problem with the tooling okay and and so for six store this became our, became our sort of call to vision here okay what we seek to replicate so if we look back to about approximately 2014 okay and prior years uh, the the amount of websites that were leveraging https so secure socket layer yeah, connections was very low. It was around 30%. Okay. And I believe the reason for that is because it was a real painful UX. Okay. Yeah. So what you had to do is let's say, for example, I, I deploy a WordPress site somewhere on some hosting provider. Okay. And I think, right, I need to, you know, have HTTPS on fairly sort of, you know, security conscious a bit. I'm a bit of a developer. I like hacking with things. So first of all, I have to work out what OpenSSL commands to run. Okay, you know, Google around, what do I run? Okay, uh, then I need to get a certificate from somebody. So I need to sign up to somebody, some CA provider. Uh, they want money, so I need a credit card. Okay, so that whoosh, there's a big majority of open source developers immediately gone. Because some mm -hmm. of them are still living at home. Do you see what I mean? All that, you know. And uh, then you need to go through this kind of thing of proving who you are. So I don't know, scan your passport or they'll give you a TXT record that you put on your C name or some, you know, and then they would ping you and eventually that would all be okay. And then they'd email you a, a zip bundle with some certificates in. And then you'd spend the rest of the day going, how the hell do I get this to work in Nginx? So mm -hmm. you'd just be copying certificates around and restarting it getting very impatient, ch mod 777, everything, you know, just get the thing working. And then you get it working, and then a year later, it would expire, and you go through the whole thing again, okay? So that was the kind of the experience, really. And then what happened was um, Let's Encrypt came along, and they said, let's make it free, okay? No matter who you are, you get it for free, okay? No special preferred treatment for anybody. And we'll give you a tool which will automate the whole thing for you. In fact, it'll even set it up so that at the end it'll spit out a comp file that you can just drop into Nginx, restart your server, you're good to go, you're protected. Okay. And then from 2014 for the next few years, whoosh, the graph went right up to 80 odd percent. Okay. Now, at the same time, what happened was the browsers started to kind of circle the wagons around HTTP. So they made it so that when you go to a HTTP site, it kind of feels a bit, yeah, am I going to catch something here? Do you mm -hmm. see what I mean? I mean, if you went to a HTTP site and it said register for an account, you're like, no, you're kidding. Do you know what I mean? I'm not doing that. You just, you know, and, and, the, and the whole experience is danger. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they managed to shift the paradigm. So now the kind of the, 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 you know, it's majority TLS everywhere almost. Do you see what I mean? The expectation is TLS should be everywhere. No matter if you've got a small little website 
because you like collecting hobby toy cars or you're a big e-commerce site, it's, it's easy to, to automate this and to get free certificates. So right now, the software supply chain, maybe not right now, but you know, going back a couple of years, it was 2014 HTTP. Okay. Mm -hmm. So package managers were pulling in stuff untrusted. There's no provenance chain, container images flying around everywhere unsigned. Okay. And, and the general predominant model was unsigned, unverified, no source of uh, provenance, no non-repudiation. All of these guarantees that you should have were not there. Okay. So the, the kind of the call to action for Sigstore was to be, and we, I can, I've said this so many times, to be to software signing what Let's Encrypt was to HTTPS. Okay. Yep. So basically try to have this free service that's available to everybody. Okay. So it could be that little 12-year-old uh, dude that builds an NPM package that's really popular to a huge fan that's generating their own stuff that they want ingested by the open source ecosystem. So the idea was that it had to be widely available to all, okay? And then we could hopefully shift the paradigm where if you pull in untrusted software, it feels a bit icky. It feels a bit dangerous. It's, it's socially unacceptable, essentially. You yes. know? And that, that, that was the kind of, that was the goal of SIGSTORE. And, um, you know, and, and like I said, I mean, it's, it's working out pretty well because we've got a lot of very large uh, open source communities that are adopting SIGSTORE now and, and starting to leverage SIGSTORE. So, you know, that, that, but that was the good sort of focus that we had to really drive forward. Yeah. No, that's sure. an amazing, yeah, it's an amazing background. And um, I think it's not, it's no coincidence whenever I'm asked about SIGSTORE, you know, by other people in the community or perhaps people who are less familiar, it's the exact analogy that I utilize in terms of the okay. way I see SIGSTORE as the comparison yeah, of sure. script. But it's also, one of the things you said is essentially the emphasis of trying to um, optimize for secure by default, you know, so making that really, really easy that you don't need to think about it. Like, don't make me think whenever it comes yeah. to security, you should think about it, but at least if you start from the principles of it's secure by default, then you're already a fantastic foundational state. Um, let's encrypt and that analogy was that, okay, and the, and the browser shift as well. And this is, we're linked to the way we think things are going in general with the ecosystem of software and software pipelines, that at some point it will have to be secure by default. And if you're not doing these things, you're not going to be the outlier. Mm -hmm. You hasn't secured artifacts. You haven't thought about provenance. You're not doing signatures and attestation, and you're going to be an outlier of somebody who people will not want to do business with, you know, mm -hmm. so we're not there yet, but that's the way that it will become. So there the browsers out there, you're going to be the consumers of software. We'll expect you to show that you're, and particular attention, due diligence to the process and making it secure by default for the software as well. And that would be a fantastic golden age if sure. we're able to arrive there. And uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic analogy. Yeah, we will very much live or die on the UX. It has to be simple yes. and seamless. I'm a developer and I have an incredibly short amount of patience with anything that gets in my way. You know, my wife will hear me and she go, what is it now? And it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm using language that I wouldn't use on a public forum. Like this. <laughs> and because uh, I've got, I'm very intolerant towards disrupting me working. Do you see mm -hmm. what I mean? So, so you're so right. This, Lee, this has to be seamless. The UX is, is really is central to this being a success in this area. Yeah, yeah, we had a lot of this with, um, sorry to just reflect that, but we had a lot of this with SC Linux when we were trying to get that off the ground at Red Hat. Right. Because developers just disable it. Yeah. Write your code, I disable it, it's someone else's problem. You see what I mean? And uh, so there was so much put in to try and make SC Linux more user-friendly like these. Did you ever see the cartoon books that came out? The Penguin and the dog mm. and from each other's food. and all sorts of tools to generate policies and you know because you do you if the if the developer if it, if it in any way impedes them or they feel it impedes them and there's too much of a time cost for them to adopt that technology it's um you're 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 paddling up the wrong way really yeah 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That whole secure by default thing is very, very, very true. Rings true in this space, and and making it easy, you know, and making it accessible mm -hmm. so that so that people will be able to enable it by default too. Um, so I think sure. an, an, another couple of points to highlight in this space with what what progress has been made is, I mean, especially with six store and all these projects, I think you know, the, the ability to sign a test, um, different formats of, of packages. I think one of the big ones, of course, that led the space was Docker images and OCI container images uh, in this space. They, that was early to this game sort of thing. And and that's kind of what, what you know, a lot of platforms, including ourselves, are supporting. Um, but I think that recently we should call out the fact that, you know, there's been a lot of movement in in a lot of different package managers and and, and, and formats. So, so NPM um, recently with their RFC uh, that came out to adopt six store uh, as as uh, as a project and a standard for them uh you know um rust as well uh i think you you mm -hmm. mentioned the keyline project stuff but but also git sign is a really important project mm -hmm. that i've been watching closely to wait uh for to get the github verified badge eventually which is which is uh, which would be great to be able to have keyless signing right uh, yeah. of your commits that that's great yeah. so any any of those you want to highlight luke you can feel free yeah i, I mean so, one thing that comes to mind, I think what we've done right, and I don't want to appear arrogant here because I've done so much wrong in my career. <laughs> got so much stuff wrong, but looking back, what, what has gone right? I think in a lot of ways, we we didn't wait for, talking about Sigstore, and I should pivot to other technologies really, but but we didn't wait for a specification. Okay? Right. We didn't wait for, you know, we, we just started to build, okay? Mm -hmm. And then discover from there, iterate, 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 okay? refine, refine, refine. And <clears throat> that then got us in the position that we had all these tools together and these language frameworks that when somebody came along that needed to solve the issue, we had something that they could use. Okay, so mm -hmm. for example, with the, the NPM stuff, we'd already been some Java work, okay. Um, there was a Shopify, we're looking to do something for Ruby gems. Ruby, yeah. Yeah. We already had a Ruby gems library because we were building all these things and, you know, and they were all there and available. And, uh, and then at the same time, I mean, to, to call out other projects is a brilliant work that's been going on at Salsa, you know, around mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, yeah. the kind of much needed definition of, of a, a kind of a roadmap to reach in an optimal secure build environment that you should have. And uh, there's also many tools coming up around generating S bombs as well. Okay, and starting to do that, and I think it's 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 an interesting juncture at the moment because there's two years has been a frenzy of innovation. You know, some incredible tooling that's built, you know, and, and companies such as yourself that are, 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 are kind of massaging these into a form that somebody can use, a customer can use. And the interesting thing is we're now at the juncture where to touch upon where you, you said earlier, where people are, are asking, how do we approach this? You know, where, where, do we, where do we begin? And we now have this juncture where uh, public sectors are starting to mandate yep. that these things should be in place, okay? So now there's a real large heavy weight leaning on enterprises to, to implement this, okay? And I think that's where we now have to sort of go to that next level of being the educators really and, and, and helping them to understand how to do that. Interestingly, and at the same time, we still have a lot of work to do as well. You know, there's, um, I mean, it's, I think in a lot of ways, I see a, a sort of a logical progression here. Uh, with Sigstore, we started to sign things, okay. And with SBOM, we're starting to generate SBOMs, okay. There's still a lot to do around the verification of these things, okay, and then, education around the S-BOM as, as well, where should it be stored? Okay, and what is the perception around an S-BOM? Because I, I think one of the dangers is that a lot of enterprises are gonna think it has an S-BOM, it's secure, which is not the case at all. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or a software project might not have an S-BOM, but it might be very secure, it might be coded very well, it might have a very low attack surface. You see, mm -hmm. yeah? So there's an, an, an S bomb will never be atomic, you know, because your use of software is, is very varied. You see, I, I could be using a, a piece of software, but I, but I might only be using a single function, mm -hmm. you know, 5% of the code base that's within that library or that framework. But I, I, you know, this is not to say there's been some incredibly 
good efforts to address these sorts of things like there's vex that's coming up yep. mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you can understand your exact exposure and uh, there's some smart people grappling with these problems you know including yourselves and, and other people that you know around the community and and um it's yeah it's just a very interesting time because we've now got that you know governments are saying mandatory you know mm -hmm. you need to you're not going to be able to use anything unless it has one of these and at the same time we're still kind of working on these yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and um, i think yeah. that's an important point thanks luke for for highlighting there because i think part mm -hmm. of the next um sort of slide that i had there was was around what does this look like in practice for the open source and for enterprise right sure. And I think a couple of the points you touched on are really good, like for for sort of an intro 101 basics to coming into this, you know, um, uh, talking about securing your software supply chain, um, you have your SBOM, your software bill of materials. Now, of course, there's a lot of uh, talk around whether this is uh, something that you're going to generate at build time when you build your actual artifact. Or is it something where you know you're you're using tools like SCA software code analysis to actually generate this after the fact, right? Now the good news is there is tooling in both ways to do that, right? There is ways to generate your SBOM at build time that, that are out there, open source project. Even if you don't have one already, let's say you're using a container image, you can use a great tool like um like SIFT, like Anchor with SIFT to call another open source project um, that um, will actually take your image and, and generate an SBOM for you, listing out a lot of the components in that package. And, and once you've generated that, you can generate those SBOMs, software bill of materials in, in two, two large formats is the ones we've seen out there. You know, of course, SPDX is one and uh, uh, Cyclone DX being the other. And so, so a lot of folks getting started, that's where they start is they, they start generating a software bill of materials. Now, now, of course, with projects like Six Door and Cosign, what you can do then is you can start signing your container artifact, your image itself, you can start signing or attesting your individual SBOMs and hosting those alongside, uh, you know, your artifacts on a tool like CloudSmith, right? You can you now, now, now not only are you showing that, hey, this is actually what's contained in this image, but you're actually attesting to the fact that, yes, I am who I say I am. And I'm also verifying that this is the image. And here's how you can show, here's how you can actually pull that down. And the next step I, I see a lot in CICD now is, is uh, with, with CI pipelines is um, folks, it's generating the SBOM and attesting, uh, doing a test in total attestations was step one. And I think the step two part of this is important is now when when users are pulling down or consumers are pulling down these packages, are they actually using the verify tool, right? Are sure. they? Yeah. But I think it's prudent to start signing and producing, definitely. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. even though the verification part is still, we're still kicking the tires there, working out the best approach. There's absolutely no reason to not start signing and generating now so that you build that historic picture. You know, you've got that mm -hmm. historical context. It's a good habit to get into, definitely. No, no need to wait until everything is, is perfect and let perfect be the enemy of good. We can, you know, there's lots of good that we can do right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So start the generation, start generating your SBOM, start signing now. And then mm -hmm. eventually when everybody comes in uh, to verification, that, that, that'll all be there. The other additional periods that you mentioned real quick that I do want to highlight for your users out there listening is um, VEX, right? The vulnerability exploitability, I think it's exchange. V, VX so, yeah. effects scores. So I think, yeah, I can never remember either. But it's 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 around this principle. And I think I know Dan Lawrence from Changar talks about this a lot, um, where the idea is, hey, it's great because you know, I mean, a lot of this to you know, we had the NIST database, the NVE, and other things like this, like uh, NVD, sorry, uh, and like other frameworks that tell you when there's a CVE present or something. But is it actually exploitable? Are you even using it in your code? So I think being able to understand these uh, CVEs and other things and to be able to score that system in some way to say, hey, this is actually fine. You know, this image is actually fine. Go ahead. So it's, it's also Adil, really, really important to tie the ecosystem together. So Luke's highlighting the fact that standards are important because they enable co-integration with different tools. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, with VEX or with SPDX, it's more than just one vendor, or more than just one solution. We have CI systems and CD systems, and there's a lot of source of information that we need to be able to tie together into, into the center place, because only then do you have a holistic view and everything you've got in terms of the pipeline. You know, And I hope that the dream is at some point is like, okay, we've got a lot of systems that are cooperating at some point mm -hmm. in the future, utilizing the standards to be able to do that, because it's machines talking to machines. 
and mm -hmm. we want to highlight the value of that in some way to the users via the attestation and the fact that they've actually got this holistic view into the software pipeline that they've built, including all the way back to every single dependency that's built in the software that you've built. And uh, a sort of probably a selfish angle from my perspective, obviously just talking about CloudSmith is that, you know, we were built as a sort of abstraction layer for the ecosystem in terms of artifact management. You know, so we think about things in terms of how could we integrate with different types of products in the ecosystem or services or tools, but offer that in a nice abstract way, regardless of the artifact format. And that's still a work in progress because, you know, it's not neat and tidy. It's a mucky business is often how people describe it to me. But, you know, I think that we can only do what we're doing based on open source ecosystem and standards, as we've talked about. So it is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lee, I think as you called out, just sorry, Luke, real quick, was the um, the idea that this is Louis Luke mentioned as well was the, the UX, you know, the user experience and the UI. That's something yes. we focus on a lot over here, right? Is is the ability to be like, hey, make this accessible for everyone. Make make it actually built into the UI so they can see it. You know, make it easy to generate, but make it also easy to host alongside and and make it easy to to verify. You know, once you have those pieces in place. Uh, you know, then you'll see a lot more adoption with users saying, hey, I actually have this button or toggle I can turn on. This is reasonably easy to do as a developer. I don't have to generate public private keys that I'll lose somewhere. You know, those pieces are really important. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, so that paper trail that Lee was describing, that's, a, that's what keeps CS, CISOs awake at night okay, yep. is what is their exact exposure to mm -hmm. any given risk when it trans when it when it when it comes to to be okay so a good example is a log for j hits okay they want to know where am i exposed you know what is the paper trail and uh and you know and and what are the high profile targets which ones are more exposed you know and that and that's where some sort of expressive framework such as vex can really come into its own then you know you can actually ascertain your your exact exposure. I think uh, so, so, someone heavy. was I'm not going to name names. Uh, it was some external <laughs> was asking me about this recently relative to S bomb and why it was important. And although there's a lot of work to do, I think the analogy that I had brought up um, related to what you're speaking about, Luke, is that you're eating food. You want to know maybe you've got certain types of intolerance. You want to know what goes into the food. And sure. perhaps you care more than that. You want to know where that food was grown, where it comes from, what country the region was. And that's not always easy to get with food, but at least there's some there's some standards in order to help with that. Software is exactly the same in terms of the S bomb is really describing about what the makeup of that was, you sure. know, and the relation between what went into it and something like Vex is well, what is the impact of what was into it, yeah. what, what went into that software? So if Vex is describing the vulnerabilities um, as they're part of something like Log4j, and the S bomb is showing you that that is part of your pipeline somewhere. You should be worried and you should be looking at remediation and thinking about you know, how we prevent this or fix things. But only with those will you have visibility. You know, mm -hmm. and I think um, this came apparent whenever I asked another CTO at some point in my recent past, do you know what software is going into the products that you're building, your, what your teams are utilizing? And uh, yes. the response was, I feel like I really should know, but I don't. And uh, I think that at that point, I realized that, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done in the ecosystem. So going back to the bare minimum of things that people should be doing, you should be thinking about the dependencies that are going to the software. We should be generating S bombs. You should be generating signatures and doing the bare minimum low hanging fruit of just uh, like checks on verification, actually checking that the products that you're building are what is received and consumed. And yes, building up a paper trail for something where we can actually sort of utilize it and enhance it upon over time, you know, as the ecosystem evolves. So Lee, yeah, I'm absolutely. going to take your analogy one step further. Sorry, Dan, I'll let you speak in a second. Yeah, no, but I want ahead, I want to add to this because I love this idea of the, you know, sort of the ingredients on the side of the box, right? So mm -hmm. I liken it and and sort of to take the next step with that, um, I liken sort of a you know, your S bomb as, as that sort of ingredients list. And then when people talk about vulnerability, exploitability with a VEX, uh, with VEX, let's say, I, I think of VEX as sort of, you know, the ingredients on the side say sugar. So you freak out initially saying, oh, there's sugar in here, but VEX will say, no, this is actually not high fructose corn syrup. This is just fructose, you know, something straight from mm -hmm. fruit. And so that's, 
sort of that peace of mind that you have to say, okay, this isn't exploitable, you know, this isn't panic. Because I know we've all run, um, you know, different tools, um, something like even Gripe will, will give you that output from Anchor, right, to total call out, um, sort of against an SBOM, they'll be able to generate, right, um, what, what vulnerabilities exist. A lot for, for a lot of that stuff, I mean, we've all seen it. There's just like initial panic. You just see the long list of stuff that's vulnerable and you're like, oh man, here we go. Again, I have to go through this whole process to check everything, but it's important to sort of like separate that signal to noise, right? Um, yeah. In terms of that, go ahead, Dan, you were going to say. No, it, it was just really to, to follow up what both Luke and Lee had said that, that you know, especially with, with, with Log4j, I mean, I, I do work in, in the trenches in the front line and the support channels lit up that day. Everybody was suddenly concerned. Mm -hmm. How do we determine our exposure? Uh, we need that visibility. They wanted that visibility on, on exactly where they had deployed this. Um, and I think it's easy to get caught up as well on uh, doing things, you know, absolutely perfectly and getting to that maximum state. If, if you look at Salsa, if you look at Salsa level four, where you need, you know, hermetic reproducible builds and things, that's quite a target to hit for a lot of people. It can be very off-putting, but the key is to do something, right? Let Salsa level one is not off-putting. It's just an automated documented build process, right? With provenance for your artifacts. And that's a, that is a great improvement. Anybody that was there is in a much better position when log for shell hit than, than anybody that's not on, on the path at all. So mm. it's not about looking at exam, like I say, set level four on the style of framework and, and thinking, oh my goodness, there's so much work to do to get there. And how do we achieve that? Just start somewhere. As Lee mm -hmm. said, yes, you know, check, check, check some sign packages, have an automated build process. You don't need to go to, to the full extent to actually reap a lot of benefit, a, a huge amount of benefit. And um, it really outweighs the effort that you have to put in just to do a little bit. So I, I did want to yeah. just say that that's definitely yeah. what I'm hearing. I think to enlarge upon that, I mean, you, you might have this sort of Fort Citadel build system, completely reproducible, every single artifact, every single line, is, there's provenance for that. And you, a developer gets their account compromised, their Gmail account. Okay, and then you know, and, and and that a lot of the time is how attacks happen. Attacks a lot of the time they aren't these complex no. buffer overflows against a piece of hardware, and you know it's 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 very simple things. It's very simple low hanging fruit where attackers get in, and that's that's what they target. They look for the simple things. Okay, and so there is so much that you can do. You know, with just you know make sure your developers have 2FA switched on. Okay, that, that, that's the yeah. key one, you know. Mm -hmm. I can tell you of a couple of really big companies that have been, that the, that the exploit has actually started around a, a compromise around single sign-on to that effect right. where a developer's account has been compromised. They then used it to uh, backdoor code to uh, a code repository and they've accessed a JIRA for closing tickets and all sorts of stuff just from a, a developer account compromise. So there, there is so much that you can do. And I think one of the things that we, we spoke about, we were just chatting before the webinar, is your, your CI environment. A lot of the time, I mean, there's, it, it's, we live in this time where developers have a lot of freedom to express themselves, okay? And this particularly plays out in CI. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful world of marketplaces and plugins and, scripts shared everywhere that you can run you know to do all these automate everything do you see what i mean and i think we kind of enjoy that we kind of there's some sort of validation that we get from changing and tinkering with things and making things automated and you know and um but a lot of the times the security can really take a back seat in that process do you see what mm -hmm. i mean so there is so much that you can do just to really take a step back and look at your CI and think, where exactly are we pulling things from? Do we really need that? Do we really need that bot that's going to say, hey, new contributor? You know, it's, it, is it really important that, you know, who's this coming from? Start to look at stuff like that, really, because um, that is part of your production chain. OK, mm -hmm. whatever you're mm -hmm. producing there whatever's been ingested there is going to be part of your production workload. 
And we never used to treat production systems that way. You know, we were very minded around hard men running scanners to make sure services that you don't need are switched off. You know, all the permissions would be locked down. All nobody accounts would be closed. You'd really harden a system. Do you see what I mean? And, and uh, we have quite a disparity now where the CI, the CI environment, it can be a bit, well, hey, you know, having lots mm -hmm. of fun here, you know, writing little trinkets and scripts to do different things. And, you know, and just, you just one click button and you put in a, something from a marketplace and then you've got this new funky thing in your CI. And, and so there's so much that you can do there as well. Mm -hmm. It really yeah. pays to develop with that, uh, yeah. with production in mind and, and you know, yeah. making yeah. that yeah. secure by default, um, you know, mantra um, continue is, is very important. Making it easy and accessible for, for developers to do that is the key, right? And Salsa also captured this quite succinctly as well. Don sort of mentioned this. We should just quickly mention Salsa really is... Yeah, yeah. I just want to mention that that's supply supply chain levels for software artifacts. So it's uh, uh, you yes, can sorry. check them out at salsa.dev. We we do want to call it out. Yeah, yeah it's it's, yeah. it's it's one of the frameworks out there that are really helping sort of advance awareness of why supply chain mm -hmm. is important, but also mm -hmm. what you can do as a company. And obviously, yeah. CloudSmith is part of what we do. There's some alignment there in terms of like we will help get you to a certain point for it, and then you know obviously there's things that you need to do to build upon that. Um, what I was going to say is that Salsa succinctly captured an aspect of just because the ecosystem is built upon level zero artifacts and they don't really do a lot, it doesn't mean that you can't achieve some level of compliance with due diligence of your own. You know, so it says something like, you know, a level four artifact produced might have been built upon a sea of level zero artifacts. But you have to start somewhere, right? You know, so I think the processes in your company, it starts with the companies here to utilize the product. Whether that's from adopting tooling like SIG store and really, really important things in the ecosystem, or by utilizing something like CloudSmith as a central source of truth for artifacts within organizations. You know, so it's pretty important to start tying it together with relevant tooling. Yeah, no, so so I just want to do a quick time check. I know we're, we're, we're low on time here. We may go a couple of minutes over just for folks if, if they want to. Um, but yeah, talking about some of the stuff, we should call out some of the projects in this space that we've talked about here. Um, I, I, before I do, I know um, uh, our, our folks over at CloudSmith have been busy in the, in the Q&A as well. Kira um, from DevRel, Kira Carey, um, who recently uh, did talks on, on a lot of open source software yeah. supply chain stuff. Um, she has a lot of great content out there. So I'm going to quickly shout out to her because I think she's got some articles on our blog and she recently did a webinar on actionable SBOM content, right? Being able to, to actually do stuff with it and analyze it and take a look at it, um, not just generate it. So I think um, feel free to check out the, the CloudSmith blog um, for some of her content. She's also done a webinar on that and she's recently done talks as well. So um, we'll include links later. I think um, Candice is including some links after and uh, uh, as well. I mean, just wanted to call out, uh, you know, Linux Foundation, Cloud Native Commun Computing Foundation. I mean, you know, a lot of the folks behind efforts like salsa.dev and, you know, like um, supporting projects like Sigstore and Cosign, I think it's really important. Um, so that's been really great. And, you know, obviously feel free to check out cloudsmith.com. We, we support open source repositories, um, secure by default. We let you generate your SBOM alongside there as well. Um, so I think the one question I will highlight here real quick um, um, from Alessandro um, is, um, it, it, there was a mention here. He said, hi all, is the SBOM signing paradigm the only way to solve this problem? So I, I'll just quickly preface this by saying, I don't think it's the only way, but in terms of um, you know formats and open source standards, um, I do feel like that's the leading thing right now, which, which the community is again, circling the wagons around like focusing on. So I do feel like it's important to focus on centralized efforts that everybody can use that are accessible, that are not locked behind enterprise platforms and stuff. Um, so go ahead, anyone. I think, well, what I will say about that is it's not the technique of SBOM and signing in itself. It's the reason why you're doing it. So SBOM's yeah. visibility, right, to be able to understand what went into the software and, and why. And then the signing side of things is, is the verification to say, can I prove that the state that I've provided with is true? You know, so certainly SBOMs and signing alone are not just the answer, but they're definitely a big part of what's necessary. Luke, have you got anything to add in terms of like additional capabilities, I think? No, yeah, I would agree with you there, Lee. It's, it's, it's what it gives us, you know, it's, it's the data sets that it'll provide for us to then be able to make decisions. 
So, but they're, they're yeah. one part of this. You know, there are lots of other controls and technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah and this, go ahead. What I would say, sorry, the other thing I would say, obviously, is uh, pick your tooling wisely. And you know, I think mm. in terms of um, utilization of the of things like this in organizations, that's really really important from the trying to think about it from a uniformity way. You know, so you really don't want to have outliers in your organization that some people do sign in this way, some people do sign in that way, or some people don't do it, or some people store their artifacts in one place and then other teams in another. The more that you can leverage doing the same things across the organization, well, one, it's more efficient, and two, you've got a sort of common language internally utilizing the same tooling. So whether it's SIG store or a different solution, it sort of doesn't matter. The outcome is that you're Generating the SBOMs, you've got visibility on what you've got, but you've also got some way of verifying the assets you're building. And you've got a secure place to store and distribute those from. That's the selfish angle, right, that we're talking about. But regardless of what the solution is, you need to take those boxes and you need to be thinking about it, I think, mm -hmm. in, in terms of your process holistically, from development, as Luke said earlier, right through to production. And that's the key to making sure that, hey, this is secure, more secure than perhaps what we started with, secure by default. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's along the lines of, uh, you know, I mean, also to just to touch on the SBOM piece of it, I mean, uh, you know, remember that that's just a, a format, like um, SBOM is just a, a principle, right? Software bill of materials, there are different formats for SBOMs. There's SPDX and Cyclone DX. And there's many, like Lee said, there's a lot of tooling around this to use these different formats and coming up in different package formats as well, um, ways to generate the different SBOM types. So it's, I think it's the principles you have to hold on to more. And I mean, the tooling is there and, you know, choose wisely, so to speak, but, but definitely it's the idea of, you know, like getting from into the mindset of, of, of securing by default for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a great way to summarize this uh, whole talk is uh, Kira has uh, posted a question in, in the chat as well, um, specifically towards Luke. She said, Luke, are there any easy tips for securing your software? So I think that's a great way to end this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so is there one easy, easy one easy tips. trick? <laughs> I think what you mentioned before yeah. in terms of start simple, right? I'm just trying to stick to the easy bit. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> easy tips to secure your software. So as I'm, I'm, I'm assuming if it's, you know, they're saying your software, they're talking about software that they write. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's open, okay, then it's going to have more eyes on it, certainly. So that's, I would yeah. say that's, it's probably a bit of a, a, a sneaky get out one. But, uh, <laughs> generally, like invite people to review your code, you know, mm -hmm. leverage peer review. That's a very good security control, which is mm. easy and free. You see, so, mm. you know, it's the best way, right? Keep it open. Peers and, 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 uh, yeah. Also work with people who are really into security and involved in the <laughs> process, right? Um, actually, yeah. this is this has come up a couple of times, like you know, in the conversation, and I've heard Linus's law, I think, mentioned several times, and it's it still holds true to to until today, and it's essentially given enough eyeballs, all bugs are yeah. shallow. And I sort of think there is an evolution to that. You know, it's it, it's fantastic, and it's a great proponent of the open source ecosystem to say, well, the more people there are to look at things then the less likely that there are issues. And that's the reason why open source works really well. You know, and I think that applies internally as well, which is basically what Luke is saying. Um, I does sort of have a jokey extension of that in my head, which was something along the lines of given enough S bombs and not, um, all <laughs> exploits are shallow, right? You know, so you know what's going into it. But the point is, is just do it, I think, you know. Mm, yeah. Mm. And something else that quickly comes to mind is uh, the OpenSSF. Go to the OpenSSF org. They've got best practices for developers. They've got lots of nice guides sure. there that can help you write secure software. Yeah, so, so thanks so much, everyone, for your time. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up by saying thank you to my colleagues, Luke Hines, Lee Skillen, and Dan McKinney for joining us today. I'm Adil Ligari uh, from, from CloudSmith. And uh, thank, thanks so much, everyone, for your time. I'm going to throw it back to Candice now. I hope that this was productive and, and uh, helpful in further discuss, furthering this discussion. Thanks, Ken. Over to you, Candice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee, Adil, Dan, and Luke for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.